ask everybody to turn off the cameras if that's possible so to improve the level of the band that we are using because today it's our very first conference uh, with this uh, system uh, in phlebology and lymphology anyway i want to thank very very sincerely andrei shuba sergio Gianesini, giovanni mosti we have the luck and the honor to have uh, three great experts as you know, uh, each of them has a huge experience in phlebology and lymphology. And so we will be happy to listen to them and I will give my little contribution. Uh, I also want to thank Martina for her help because uh, she's our technical uh, uh, expert and she will help me also with the questions and answers and so on. And uh, basically my introduction is just to explain that we want to deal with compression treatment, of course, but trying to explore different topics and probably also beyond the classical phlebology and lymphology topics. So I don't want to be long. And again, thanking everybody. Uh, I know that we are on Zoom up to 100 participants. And anyway, some of uh, our friends are already on YouTube because we are going live on YouTube as well. And so for everybody who wants can follow us also on YouTube. To make it short, I want to introduce now the very first speaker who is Sergio Giannesini. Sergio is a great friend of mine, but also vice president of UIP, International Union of Phlebology. And we decided together about very complex topics because Sergio doesn't like uh, uh, easy topics and easy tasks. So he will speak about uh, hot topics in compression treatment, pelvic congestion syndrome and peripheral arterial obliterating disease. We have about 20 minutes per speaker and then uh, there will be the first discussion after the first two presentations. So Sergio, the microphone is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Attilio, and uh, indeed it's a pleasure being here, not because I like difficult topics, but because we are among friends uh, and also huge experts for which uh, we thought about brainstorming uh, on uh, hot topics uh, in compression, in particular peripheral arterial disease uh, and pelvic venous uh, disorders. These are my conflicts of interest, and I declare that it is indeed interesting to me to dive into this uh, topic of peripheral arterial disease uh, and uh, compression, starting uh, indeed uh, wondering if it is a hot topic for real or not. What can we say about uh, the possibility of uh, compressing our patients if uh, they have peripheral arterial disease? Because there is usually the misconception that it is uh, an absolute contraindication. For sure, we know from the literature that it can happen under inappropriate application of compression. And for sure, we don't want pictures like this in our patient's album. It is reported that we can have these, let's say, pressure injuries in this paper, for example, at the percentage in the study population was 7.2 associated with the graduated compression stockings in 31% of cases. And interestingly, a very good number was associated with diabetes as well. So it will be interesting to dissect the topic in peripheral arterial disease and in diabetic patients as it was done recently in an interesting paper. I encourage you and I really thank all the co-authors of this paper to read this paper that is uh, the results of the winter 2019 meetings in terms of analysis of similarities and controversies uh, regarding guidelines from all around the world with two chapters uh, dedicated uh, to compression. If you look indeed at the guidelines or at the consensus documents, for example, from Europe 2018, we see that an ankle pressure of 70 millimeter mercury is considered a threshold and that uh, an arterial bypass crafting is considered a contraindication. Now, actually, with an update in 2020 from the same group uh, suggesting 60 millimeter mercury and the possibility of compressing when there is bypass, but of course, uh, avoiding the compression of epifascial bypass uh, chondrites. If we travel a little bit around the world, we see that the Indian uh, group is uh, suggesting a little bit of different pressure with 80 millimeter of mercury and the Canadian are pointing out a very important fact which is education of the health professional and a proper 
prescription. As you can see, they are even pushing it a little bit farther, saying uh, that even in critical cases, uh, compression could be considered, but of course, uh, just uh, after proper prescription of an expert. Some literature I suggest you to read, for example, uh, this one uh, that is uh, showing uh, how in mixed transfer there could be an interesting effect of compression with different values based on the ABI. But you will see that these ABI values are quite contradictory because indeed uh, there is uh, quite a disagreement in the relative contraindications to compression, as you can see from this analysis of 20 guidelines published in 2017. And in particular, the gray area is uh, the one of ABI 0 0.6, 0 0.8, as pointed out by this other recent paper that is uh, assessing the lack of consensus uh, among 13 venous leg answers clinical practice guidelines. But sometimes a contraindication is a good indication. So if we really dive into the literature, we see some hints, for example, from the Hidayati group that is uh, suggesting a proper compression with bandages and then uh, switched to graduated compression stockings in case of mixed arterial answer. I really suggest you to read the paper that is presenting interesting flow charts like this one, considering, as you can see, compression, both in ABI below 0 0.7 and above 0 0.7, of course, after proper evaluation of the patient. But then we could wonder why we want eventually to compress these patients. So I try to sum up with uh, five main reasons, in my opinion, of course, uh, managing the concomitant chronic venous disease. And as we will see in a few minutes, uh, it is quite often concomitant. To heal mixed answers, as you, uh, you will see, it is quite often that we have mixed answer. To manage the edema in general, in particular after surgical procedure. And at the end of this talk, uh, we will touch also the topic of the tissue perfusion that can be eventually uh, included by the proper compression. As I was saying, the concomitant aspect is interesting uh, if we consider chronic venous disease and peripheral arterial disease. We know that at least 23% of the adults of our population are affected by varicose veins. And uh, we know that up to 20% of our population, of course, uh, uh, in the most advanced ages, uh, is affected by arterial disease. We also know that 20% of our answers are multifactorial with a large component that uh, is uh, mixed, so arterial and venous. This very interesting paper by Makivar group that goes back a little bit in time is showing an interesting fact. Arterial disease, but not hypertension, predisposed to varicose veins, as you can see from the odds ratio. And vice versa, person with varicose veins have a high subsequent incidence of arterial disease. And we could discuss if you want later on in the discussion time, uh, why it could be like this. But more interesting, most interesting, the thing I was noticing is that it is true also if you clear for risk factor, for example, for BMI. In this paper, for example, independently by the BMI, there was uh, this association between arterial and venous which is quite contradictory because in this other paper in reality, pelvic, uh, sorry, the peripheral arterial disease is associated with advanced chronic venous disease, as you can see with an odds ratio of uh, three. And among the most significant risk factor, there is BMI, which is a little bit contradictory with uh, what we found before. The most uh, recent literature, very interesting, this one with MRI and geography looking at chronic venous disease in arterial patients is showing us that indeed uh, there are signs of chronic venous insufficiency in up to one out of five of our peripheral peer disease patients. And again, in this case, BMI is considered an important factor. Even more interestingly, I would say, there is uh, just 18% of these individuals who are found with peripheral arterial disease presenting chronic venous disease previously diagnosed. So usually this is an underdiagnosed condition, the one of advanced chronic venous disease in peripheral arterial disease. So we should always look carefully at this aspect. But then the amyletic question, should we compress or not these uh, patients? If we go back in the literature again, 2015, in this case, we are looking at intermittent pneumatic compression, so a little bit of a different topic. We see the interesting fact that even in critical ischemia, we have an improvement of the cutaneous blood perfusion. 
Another paper, again with intermittent pneumatic compression, is uh, showing uh, an improvement in terms of uh, flow, in terms of uh, peak walking time, in terms of wound surface reduction, pain, quality of life. A thing that I like to stress in uh, this uh, talk is uh, the fact that, of course, compression can help, but it can help just if it is uh, supervised, as demonstrated in uh, this paper, meaning the importance, particularly in uh, this uh, challenging field of uh, the mixed component, uh, so arterial and venous, uh, has to be uh, managed by uh, health professionals who are properly trained. If so, if uh, there is a proper prescription, uh, you can see from the literature quite recent, 2017, that the proper compression does not decrease the walking capacity of our peripheral arterial disease patients, uh, with also improvement uh, in uh, the oxygenations, as you will see in other paper. In this one, was showing no significant uh, differences. There are already studies showing us the potential benefit of proper compression with graduated compression stockings in patients with diabetes, like this publication from WHO. And interestingly, as you can see, they were watching also at the skin perfusion parameters and the eventual compromission of the arterial component, showing no compromission in terms of perfusion and a benefit in terms of edema control confirming the safety of a proper prescription by the fact that the adverse events were not basically related to the compression issue. Having a look at the most recent publication, 2020, we see the paper by Stucker that is showing in C3-C5 patients with an ABI of 0 0.5, 0 0.9, acral photoprotismography and MMCQ results, showing actually that the toe systolic arterial pressure was improved, and the quality of life was improved as well. But uh, what I would consider the most interesting paper on uh, this uh, topic published recently is this one by the Rother group. That is uh, dissecting uh, the population in diabetic patients, as you can see, peripheral arterial disease patients, and also healthy control. A very nice uh, study, really well done. I have to congratulate uh, the group because they look at 0 0.6 or 0 0.9 of ankle brachial index. Again, 60 minuter mercury with two different classes of uh, compression, as you can see, 18, 21, 23, 32. And they really looked at uh, the details of this population, even considering, for example, the palestigia score. They look with white light tissue spectrometry, laser Doppler fluorometry. And what they did nice was also assessing these patients in different positions, supine, sitting, standing, leg elevation, in a three different position, as you can see from the picture, the toe, lateral ankle, and calf. Now, if we look at the subject when the subject is sitting down, there is, as you can see, no perfusion compromission at the toe, and there is actually a perfusion improvement uh, in both the classes of compression at the ankle. Now, if we put the same diabetic subject standing up, again, no perfusion compromission at the toe, no perfusion compromission at the ankle. Now, if we put the subject legs up, then we have a little bit of an issue with uh, the perfusion, as you can see at the toe and also at the ankle. Now we are talking about diabetic patients. We can look also at the peripheral arterial disease patients with our diabetes. And then again, sitting, again, no perfusion compromission in both sides. Perfusion compromission when they were standing up at the toe, but uh, at the ankle, no perfusion compromission, actually a sign of improvement. And again, legs up in peripheral arterial disease, perfusion compromission at the toe, perfusion compromission at the ankle. Now, this is not in reality surprising, the fact that we have a perfusion compromission whenever we are going legs up. It was already demonstrated already 11 years ago by the group of Park with the transcutaneous partial oxygen tension evaluation, showing that indeed this is the position in which we have actually an improvement of the parameter compared to this one that is, of course, the worst one for the patients. But interestingly, as you will see later on in the study I was mentioning, the same thing was happening in the healthy subject. So it's not a matter of peripheral arterial disease, but a matter of position of the leg indeed. So we can conclude by this interesting uh, Rother study that uh, there is uh, with uh, 
proper compression, of course, and proper prescription, no reduction in the microperfusion. There is an improvement in the perfusion in specific locations. And when we have a compromission, health volunteers are showing similar results. And again, this is in line with what was already published many years ago, 1994, by Abu Owen, that was showing indeed the improvement of the perfusion in the different positions, of course, for proper pressure values. So I suggest if you are passionate about historical literature to go back to 1994. Indeed, the data are in the literature already on this topic and have been there for quite a while. You see 2012, the same group of uh, Wu was already showing in diabetes patients and no adverse events in terms of proper compression with an improvement in cutaneous edema and in the circumferences with the ABI that was actually even improving in a specific uh, classes. And then we have uh, the same uh, demonstration of safety with the bandages by Mitten in 2010, but of course a very small population. So I would uh, consider more data to dive into this topic also because bandaging, of course, as we know, is affected by the variability of the interface pressure based on who is applying the compression. So we should really dive into the topic with proper interface pressure measurements. Rother was also showing uh, that uh, proper compression, both class one and class two, show no adverse events, so confirming the safety of the prescription and also the good uh, wearing uh, comfort, uh, particularly for class uh, one, as you can see, one uh, is uh, the optimal uh, wearing comfort, uh, 10 was a massive impairment. Going toward the conclusion, some tips and uh, tricks about uh, compression or not in uh, these uh, patients. I would uh, give you the tips and tricks of enjoying this nice uh, paper that uh, is showing different risk factors that are determining the kind of agenda we want to follow in terms uh, of monitoring uh, the ABI. So you see based on the different risk factors, they are recommending different uh, timing. There are wonderful papers that, by giants like O'Donnell, for example, on the optimal management of peripheral arterial disease, but too often uh, we forget about compression. So we should always remember to assess also this uh, topic that could be of help. Same thing for this publication of Pereira, so the treatment strategy for the Claudican patients uh, that are really not uh, including up to my knowledge compression while I think they should include the topic. This is a contribution from our research group at the University of Ferrara, where we use a test of toe flexion to assess by near infrared retroscopy the oxygenation depth uh, under compression, as you can see, around 18 millimeter mercury, showing uh, an interesting effect. The higher the CEP, the higher the benefit for these patients, and the lower the ABI, the higher the benefit. Even more interestingly, what I wrote over here, you see 13% of those who obtained greater benefits would actually have not received a prescription of uh, a stocking on the basis of just the ABI. So it's a really a, an interesting research land where we could uh, spend more time always remembering that prescribing a stocking is as gladly like prescribing a drug. The drug could be extremely beneficial, but of course we have to be aware on what we are prescribing that of course has the uh, proper dose, uh, proper type, uh, and of course a certified product. All this uh, must be clearly explained to our patients, so particularly for the challenging situation of arterial and venous. So in this way, we'll be able to, to confirm that compression is a safe and beneficial also in arterial patients, in specific arterial patients, of course, not all the arterial patients, and of course, under proper supervision. Now, the real hot topic, I would say, until you ask me to talk about the pelvic venous disorder. This is hot for real. This is hot for multiple reasons, both epidemiologically and also because it's a difficult topic because we have no literature. Consider that, as you know, pelvic venous disorder uh, is associated uh, strongly with chronic pelvic pain, second cause, as we know, after endometriosis. So we are talking about a condition that is as frequent as asthma, as back pain. So it's very important we don't forget about this disease as it was reported in this uh, paper. Consider that uh, up to 40% of women are referred for specialist evaluation. Very probably this is an optimistic uh, estimation, very probably it's far less than 40%. 
So for this reason, we designed the Pelvic uh, Venous Disorder Online project with the Bewin Foundation and invite you to go back to the website and uh, watch all the webinars dedicated to this topic because indeed uh, it is everyday practice. If you consider that 20% of our chronic venous disease patients uh, can present some uh, pelvic symptoms and that 30% of uh, the patients with the pelvic venous disorders actually present uh, some form of perineal varices. It's interesting also from a pathophysiological standpoint, if you consider that the model is really similar to the triad that we usually use, uh, of course, uh, for uh, lower limb chronic venous disease with concepts of obstruction, reflux, and stagnation. And also the microcirculatory aspects that are quite similar in terms of hypoxia with the consequent inflammation associated with an active venous hypertension as nicely reported by this paper of Malone that is related to the, of course, uh, pump effect at the abdominal level and the passive hypertension associated with the reflux on the hydrostatic column. Now, the reason why this topic is particularly hot is uh, that it is like having one digit push-ups. There is just one single study, up to my knowledge, regarding the topic, and uh, I'm happy to be concentrated on this topic by the expert. If there is some other paper, I would be happy to discuss it because I don't know about that. So in this uh, paper by Gavrilov, 74 patients with pelvic venous disorders were divided in three quite small groups, as you can see, because just 14, 12 patients here with symptomatic pelvic venous disorders and no leg involvement in the first group, asymptomatic pelvic venous disorder with leg involvement, and symptomatic pelvic venous disorder with no leg involvement, but some form of edema. Now, they were reporting class two with different kind of compression. For example, this group had just some shorts, this one shorts and uh, lower limbs, so graduated compression stockings, and uh, this group uh, graduated compression stockings. I was not able to identify how many millimeter mercury, it was just written class two. So we should always remember to specify because as we know, the classes are changing uh, uh, around the world. So in group one with uh, compression, so we're talking about the shorts, there was an improvement, a significant improvement clinically speaking, and also as you see at the objective measurement in the angiography. If you look at the second group, so asymptomatic pelvic, but with the leg veins involvement with the shorts, there was uh, angiolytic compression stockings, there was a positive effect both at the angiography and at uh, the clinical part. But if we look at the third group, there was no significant improvement with um, just graduated compression stockings. Now, this uh, last point should be discussed uh, together with the potential biases associated uh, with the study, the heterogeneous population, the limited number of cases, uh, the importance of the specifics, not just of the dose of the drug, as we were saying before, so the dose of uh, the stockings, so the millimeter mercury, but also the type of drug, so in this case, the type of compression uh, therapy we are using. Uh, related compression stockings can be below knee, above knee, as we know, different kinds. The compliance assessment is also fundamental, and also it's fundamental, as we have seen also before, the BMI, to really understand the kind of venous hypertension we are having, and also understanding uh, the lifestyle of this population to be sure that everything is uh, homogeneous. Interestingly, the same Gavrilov, uh, that is uh, publishing a very interesting paper, published also this uh, one on uh, pelvic venous disorder influence on chronic venous disease of the lower extremities, showing an important fact. Pelvic venous disorder patients are more prone to develop, for example, leg pain, four of outs ratio, edema, up to seven of outs ratio, heaviness, up to five of outs ratio, and two times more severe varicose veins. Now, I was wondering, in reality, all these aspects have been demonstrated to be properly covered by compression by other papers. So we understand that this is a really hot topic with some hints from previous publications that are interesting, like uh, this paper by Latimer, that is a very nice paper showing again 1821, 23, 32 of uh, compression, showing a dose dependent effect in the increasing of the leg outflow. So an improvement of the drainage of the lower limb that of course could be particularly beneficial in pelvic venous disorder patients who are leaking down in the limb as we have seen before. 
And this other publication showing not just in anti-subjects uh, the effect of, on the outflow, but also in patients with varicose veins showing an improvement in the venous filling index and in the outflow fraction. A point I touched uh, in uh, the POP uh, series of webinars, and you can find them, uh, as I was saying, in the website if you want to dive into that topic, is a, a surprising paper that really shocked me when I read this a few months ago in 2020 was published. 3% of all the patients who are going to the gynecologist are actually presenting an incidental uterine venous plexus thrombosis. All the patients, like whoever is going to the gynecologist, 3% of incidental thrombosis. So we go back to the Cochrane 2010 talking about uh, the quality of the literature showing a possible reduction of approximately, in this case, DVT risk associated with compression. So we, so we could talk a lot about the role of compression in uh, uh, thrombosis prevention and the potential role in these patients. Of course, always pointing out the importance of studies that are reporting in the proper way compression so that we can assess them, for example, interface pressure has always to be reported because we have reports indeed of how graduated decompression stockings could be used incorrectly so failing the literature we are assessing. This is particularly important in the pelvic venous disorder if we consider that the same pelvic venous disorder as reported in this paper is still lacking outcome measures to really understand the impact of a therapy or a prevention like a compression could be. So this is our fault. We made this mistake, I think, and I'm involved with that. So it's my fault as well, uh, not mentioning this in uh, the last consensus document we did with the UAP on uh, pelvic venous disorders. Uh, and we should point out also in the next research topics, uh, like in this paper from Kilnani, we have to assess the importance of stockings in uh, these kind of patients. Always remember, Wing, uh, I think that is uh, particularly dear to me and the projects we are developing with the WIN, uh, the importance of no fake news in venous lymphatics, so the importance of not, uh, uh, um, not certified products. We have to be sure that the product is certified, that uh, there is a proper instruction of the prescribers, because it has been demonstrated that up to 63% of the patients who are not compliant to get rid of compression stockings are not compliant because there was not a good prescription. This goes with the knowledge, goes with the attitude of prescribers, that goes with the final behavior. And these three aspects are linked together as demonstrated by this nice paper in 2019 that is pointing out an important fact. It's not just about the doctors, it's about all the health professionals. Indeed, in this study, 81% of the prescribers were nurses. Important also to inform the patients properly. So I invite you to visit uh, the WIN website where you can find in different languages, uh, several questionnaires in different languages, uh, clicking through our forms. Uh, you will participate also to a raffle prize that will lead you to the next uh, events of the WIN. They are always in nice places where there is some calf pump activation in sport activities. The next one will be in Dubai, focusing indeed on the topic uh, of the fake news, 40% of medical websites are including them. So it's important to report uh, them. If you find them, this is a, a link where you can report so that we will report them in a consensus document that we will present during uh, the Universal Expo in Dubai next February, where I hope we will finally be on together soon. Thank you so much, Attilio. I hope somebody listened Thank and didn't so speak. Much, for... <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Sergio. So. It was a very detailed presentation and we thank you. As I told before, uh, I kindly invite you everybody to put your question on the chat section on the chat uh, window we have in Zoom. And now it's the turn of Professor Suba from Wrocław in Poland. I had the luck to be in Wrocław when I was very young vascular surgeon, so I saw many of them working on veins and arteries. But uh, Andrzej is uh, the current uh, International Society of Lymphology president. So we have the boss of the bosses in lymphology and we are very glad about that. Also, we have uh, uh, Andrzej who is uh, the head of the Department of Angiology, Hypertension and Diabetology in Wrocław in Poland. So he has a very large experience on lymphedema. The question now is, uh, do we really need manual lymphatic drainage beyond compression? Probably there is not much evidence, but I wanted to ask him to 
speak about this topic. So he will discuss about compression with or without manual lymphatic drainage in lymphedema. And your turn. Thank you very much again. Uh, dear Attila, dear friends, uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, web webinar. It is already very interesting. I was listening to Sergio, it was a great lecture. So uh, let me share my slides. So uh, yeah. the topic compression. Perfect. Uh, compression with or without manual lymphatic drainage in lymphedema. Uh, important and interesting topics here are my consequent interest. Uh, first, uh, the question about the about the history of MLD. What is manual lymphatic drainage? It was. Uh, Andrei, sorry. Can, yes? can you uh, click on the full screen? It would be yes, nice sure. to see. Okay. Right. Now okay. better? Okay. Good. So the manual lymphatic drainage was developed by Emil Goder and his wife in the 30s of, uh, of 19th and 20th century to treat migraine and sinusitis. And uh, his idea was that congestion uh, in the swollen lymph glands were the, on the root of the uh, cause of these conditions. And uh, he designed this manual lymphatic drainage for treatment and was successful. In the 60s, Aslan and Wittlinger applied manual lymphatic drainage to treat uh, lymphedema and later, uh, together with Aslan and Foldy, uh, they included MLD into lymphedema treatment strategy called complex decongestive therapy. And uh, um, until now, uh, complex decongestive therapy is considered the standard therapy for lymphedema, and it is uh, recommended by the International Society of uh, Lymphology. Uh, what exactly is manual lymphatic drainage? And is, uh, it's working or not? So there are many descriptions and many schools I, that uh, um, I will show later. And however, it is described as a light skin stretching massage that helps promote the movement of lymphatic fluid out of the swollen limb. And the therapy is applied to unaffected areas first to decongest the region. And uh, it from Vader, it developed into different schools, different techniques, a small difference. And recently we see that uh, fluoroscopy guided manual lymphatic drainage and some other modifications. Uh, so, uh, other techniques, uh, different kind of motions used to the mod depending on part being treated. Uh, for this base of non water, but it uh, uh, emphasizes relaxations and encircling strokes. And Kazlism is another type of treatment, and lead back also in other. I'm talking about this because we all. Looking at the various studies, we see description of ma uh, that manual lymphatic drainage was applied, but very little about technique, then they are slightly different and maybe they work differently. So the manual lymphatic drainage is usually performed with the patient in the lying position. It starts and ends up with deep diaphragmatic breathing. Uh, breathing, however, not in all schools it is used. The unaffected lymph nodes and regions of the body are treated first. And also when you look at the MLD techniques on YouTube, there are many types and usually it's not the case. It moves from proximal to distal to drain uh, affected areas and so the rhythmical movements and uses gentle pressure. Um, complex decongestive uh, uh, Therapy include acute, uh, have acute phase and maintenance phase. In acute phase, we have a manual lymphatic drainage and it is followed by compression bandages and the congestive exercises and it includes meticulous skin care. It's usually repeated daily for two to six weeks. And then it's followed by maintenance phase when we uh, use compression garments worn daily, sometimes self-applied MLD and the congestive exercises. Uh, this is example of some uh, te of the technique, the pictures from of our therapist treating patients with primary lymphedema. 
So the lymph manual lymphatic drainage is told to stimulate lymphatic contractility and lymph nodes, and it works especially in the early stages of lymphedema. The effect of MLD on lymphatic system and its effectiveness in therapy of lymphedema is frequently questioned, however. So we have to ask if we have any evidence that this technique actually works. And do we have sufficient evidence that MLD is important and indispensable component of uh, CDT? Uh, so it was shown already by late Professor Olszewski that a soul massage uh, stimulate uh, lymphatic uh, contractions. And he was able to show that manual lymphatic drainage actually works. However, he was uh, quite skeptical about it. And also, the recently, the efficacy of uh, manual lymphatic drainage was proven by direct lymph flow measurements and by ICG lymphography. Uh, these are still some examples of Presol Olszewski work that shows contraction and increase in lymph pressure uh, with manual lymphatic drainage. And here are example is example of manual lymphatic drainage with effect on lymphatic flow with ICG lymphography, and we see almost no stagnant flow to without MLD, and then during MLD. MLD, we see rapid contractions and much faster flow of lymph. And this is healthy limb. Here we have a lymphedematous limb. We see massage of foot and slowly we see stimulations of lymph flow. So we can say that now we have direct evidence that this technique actually can stimulate uh, lymphatic flow. The question is if it's enough and if it is necessary to combine it with other types of treatment, especially with compression bandages. Mm -hmm. MLD is applied and studied usually together with other types of physiotherapy, especially with compression bandaging exercises, as with uh, CDT, also with intermittent compression, um, in intermittent pneumatic compression, and some, uh, um, and very often with CDT and IPC, like in method called the Duke method. So multilayer uh, bandaging is now standard therapy for lymphedema. Here we uh, see example how we teach patient, actually family member, to bandage a swollen limb. Uh, that's some pictures from our center. We see various layers of uh, first cotton, then mobiderm, uh, then low stretch bandages, and bandaging of whole limb. Uh, this technique is very, we know it is very effective. However, if it's necessary to use MLD, this is, there are many studies. I just present one of early my studies um, that we show that if, uh, that co complex decongestive therapy actually is able to reduce the volume of both leg and arm edema by over 50%. And it uh, is maintained during the follow up and it's in different patient populations. And there's one example, but we, there are many published studies showing that CDD actually works. Uh, in recent ISL consensus from uh, last year, uh, we say that CDD is still standard therapy for lymphedema, but there's a note that there are several systematic reviews with meta-analysis concluding that MLD, in, but in breast cancer-related arm lymphedema has no or very little additive effect of compression therapy. And it is discussed for last probably 20 years. Uh, so this is one study, one example, one study from my colleagues from Krakow. And they were able to show in, uh, to show in 
women uh, 26 in compression bandaging group and, uh, and, the, and 25 in uh, CDT group. They were able to show that actually the effect of CDT is very similar to effect of uh, compression bandaging alone. The study was done is in women with breast cancer related lymphedema in stage two and three, not in stage one. Also, the maintenance during the maintenance phase, there was no significant difference after six months in the lymph volume. So they have found that there was very similar edema volume reduction in both groups. The improvement remained constant in both groups after six months, and uh, uh, there were similar improvement in um, uh, health-related quality of life. Uh, as I uh, told, it is only one example of those studies. There are many studies showing the same, almost the same effect. So there were also um, uh, published analysis. Uh, one, uh, the first one is from Cochrane. That from uh, uh, 20, uh, 2016, uh, and the conclusion was that MLD is safe, that's for sure, and may offer additional benefit to compression bandaging for swelling reduction uh, compared to individuals with moderate to severe breast cancer lymphedema. Those with mild to moderate may be the ones who benefit from adding MLD. Uh, however, it needs to be confirmed by randomized data, so we are not sure about this. Uh, however, uh, all of us who use MLD know that in early lymphedema, we uh, very clearly uh, see some effect immediately, and the patients are very happy. However, in the long term, there's, uh, there's not, the effect is not that significant. The more recent meta-analysis of 12 randomized uh, trials showed that MLD cannot significantly reduce or prevent lymphedema in patients after breast cancer surgery. Uh, more studies are required, however, but those studies really show that there's not necessary helpful or essential uh, or necessary. Um, also, no significant effect of MLD on health-related quality of life with chronic edema was shown. So, current evidence does not support MLD as an important and necessary part of lymphedema treatment. MLD does not improve volume reduction or quality of life is in breast cancer uh, related lymphedema. MLD, I must say, is time consuming. It takes 40 to 60 minutes and significantly increases cost of lymphedema uh, therapy. And definitely it is not cost effective uh, treatment. Uh, compression bandaging and other non-elastic compression systems are the most effective methods of lymphedema volume reduction. So, however, we have definitely evident gaps, evidence gaps in uh, on um, MLD studies. The majority of studies are small studies. And the published studies are only in breast cancer related lymphedema. We have no studies comparing CDT with compression uh, and benzene alone in uh, lower extremity lymphedema. Uh, in published studies, little or no information about timing and, and technique of MLD. So we don't know if it was water, PLD. Sometimes there's some information, but no details. Uh, no studies of effectiveness, uh, on effectiveness of different MLD techniques. So conclusion, we need more evidence. Uh, so what we do in our center? Um, we use MLD only in early lymphedema and usually as a part of uh, teaching self-MLD technique to our patients. We do not use MLD in patients with ISL stage three and uh, two and three, uh, basically because of lack of time. And our experience for many years shows that we it really does not add um, uh, and much to the uh, treatment. So we use compression bandaging and a pneumatic pump, and we can treat patients like this. It's quite big guy with primary lymphedema of leg, and uh, we were able to achieve very significant volume reduction only with bandaging and pump. 
So, uh, well, this is just an example, but we have many studies like this and we don't use MLD in our practice. So the take home message would be that existing evidence does not support MLD in, uh, in lymphedema treatment. And MLD might be beneficial in early lymphedema. However, there's little published evidence. We have it, uh, it is basically expert opinion. And is our town hall from Wrocław, as you remember, Attilio. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Andrzej. Your conclusions were very tough, let's say. So I expect some, uh, some questions, and I already see some questions on the, on the screen. So to make it short, I would say we may have uh, uh, some discussion. We have about 15 minutes to discuss. I would start with Sergio, if he's online, I hope so. Yes, he's here, okay. So uh, first of all, let's have a look if we have any questions from YouTube or from Zoom about the first presentation, because I have a couple of questions that we will now check. We have questions uh, uh, in the uh, chat box of Zoom. We have uh, Urska, I'm sorry for pronunciation. That's for, uh, that's for uh, Shuba. Uh, Shuba. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, okay. so, okay. I would start, I would with, start one with, with one question. Mm -hmm. I would start, I would with, start one with one question to Sergio. And then we see if we have more questions, okay? Can you listen? Can you hear me, Sergio? Yes. Okay. So you spoke about the possibility to control obliterating disease. I have seen often some discussion about the need to take uh, uh, in consideration the maximal systolic pressure or the ABI, the ankle brachial index, as a measure to understand if we can compress or not and which kind of compression. So first of all, is there any evidence or what's your opinion about that? I think, I think uh, that's a very gray area because as uh, we demonstrated with the paper from Lamberti that I was mentioning from our research group in Ferrara, actually 13% of patients uh, were with an ab ABI that was really critical uh, for which they would have not received uh, traditionally compression actually benefited significantly from compression. So this really tells us uh, that we cannot uh, rely on just one single parameter because if not, also it would be extremely easy to make a prescription if it was a simply a binary code with ABI one level and then you can compress, that would be super easy to learn how to prescribe. In reality, I think we have to always consider the patient 360 degrees. So the patient's compliance with the treatment, how the patient is able to eventually report eventual complications if you are going to prescribe that in a critical area. Uh, the analysis of the guidelines, in particularly the one on uh, 13 venous legs ulcers uh, uh, guidelines, uh, was showing that indeed there is a significant heterogeneity in the indication in the area of 0 0.6 to 0 0.8. So I think it's just a starting point, ABI, that is guiding us at the beginning. But uh, as also reported by the Canadian guidelines, there are some critical cases that uh, can still benefit from compression even with uh, low ABI. I really want to stress out the fact that this does not mean that we can compress whoever. This just means that we really have to learn how to apply compression at best in every single case. And there are cases in which uh, we should not, of course, put compression. That's my opinion. You're mute, Ottilia. You're mute. Unmute yourself. Okay, here I am. Sorry, I forgot to turn on the microphone. And the second question I had about the pelvic congestion syndrome, I read that the paper that you presented had only the, the let's say, the short, it was not a panty somehow. No, they, 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 had, they had three different kind of compression. So they had uh, the panties in, in one group. They had panties plus stockings, but they wasn't able to identify in the paper if they were below knee, above knee, if, uh, and what was uh, the exact millimeter mercury applied. And uh, the third group was using just graduated compression stockings. Uh, now, it's a very interesting study, but I think we have... Uh, to propose the same design in bigger scale, uh, clearing uh, from potential biases, uh, because up 
up to this moment, the main conclusion is that the panties were working, but we, we know pretty well, I think, that compression is not just simply the, the macro effect of compression. So I, I doubt, particularly not having the BMI parameter of these patients, that the simple external compression at the basin level could, could really explain the phenomenon observed. And it's pretty interesting that there was no significant benefit uh, considering that there was uh, edema in the group uh, with just lower limb issues because we know that uh, to find a relief in edema, uh, a small pressure is enough to, to have the benefit. So it's a very interesting topic, but uh, I, I know that Professor Whiteley is uh, running some investigations, but he's under data collection uh, stage. So I really encourage everybody to, to dive into the research in this topic, but with proper data collection, of course. Okay, I can't see any more questions, let's see. On the contrary, so we thank Sergio again. On the contrary, we have uh, 200,000 <laughs> questions for Andre. <laughs> so <laughs> be prepared. <laughs> so before I start with the question, just one little consideration. I liked and I like manual lymphatic drainage a lot because I've been performing and so on and so on. So somehow I see it as a complementary uh, treatment because it is able to move the lymph towards the collateral pathways and it is able to work on the lymph nodes, which is not possible with single compression. Having said this, I was, let's say, watching your slides very carefully because told that uh, it is not so mandatory in the worst scenarios, let's say. So, mm -hmm. okay, that's the very beginning of the discussion. Then okay. I can start with the question. Let's go one by one. So uh, they want to know from you, Anjay, uh, what about five years? Did any of the bandaged patients develop trunk lymphedema? So somehow the question, the issue of single bandaging as treatment, if they can, the single bandage can induce, let's say, the root of the limb, lymphedema or the trunk? Uh, yes, very good question. And uh, actually, there's something that we are afraid of. And uh, initially, we, you, uh, we, we always use CDT, and uh, we are afraid that we can move fluid from, for instance, leg to the genital area, especially. And uh, it did happen in few cases, uh, uh, even with, uh, with uh, manual lymphatic drainage. However, I even recently, yesterday, asked my physiotherapist, we, we do a lot of lymphedema patients, and we don't use uh, for the severe lymphedema patients uh, uh, MLD. And uh, so, no, we haven't seen mo significant movement of fluid and, and swelling in those patients. So this is not that common. I must say, as I stated, that the, really patients like it and I especially in mild cases we, you can see the uh, movement of fluid quite quickly so it is very, it is nice technique the question is if it's if it's worth we don't have too much we have many patients with severe edema and if it is time consuming and is it is the ed, additive effect is small and as many studies shown it's Maybe not worthy, but I agree. It, uh, I cannot say that it doesn't work at all. But I, what I, what it seems to me that in severe cases of lymphedema, the benefit of adding MLD is relatively small. Okay, so then Franz Josef Shingale somehow agreed on your presentation, and they told it. He says that. Uh, uh, when it is not available, uh, the, the congestion lymphatic treatment uh, can keep the results anyway without manual lymphatic drainage. So there are people in favor and people contrary to your somehow lack of evidence. For example, from Isa Forner uh, mm -hmm. says that their experience in Spain with the randomized con control trial is a little bit different. So somehow they say that with manual lymphatic drainage, you may have more, let's say, better results. And then from Algeria, there are, uh, I think, uh, some experience from physiotherapy. Uh, so they want to know uh, how, how much is the pressure that you should use with the manual lymphatic drainage? 
Well, it's really well. It depends. In that, when you the when you use manual lymphatic drainage to soften the edema with the hard swelling, you should use higher pressure. And it is not true that you can damage existing lymphatics with higher pressure. So we usually use higher pressures with, with fingers. However, to stimulate the flow of lymphatics, really light touch is enough. It was shown by ICG lymphography. But so we, we need two things. One is to stimulate lymphatic flow, which doesn't need much uh, uh, strong touch. But with this hardened edema, we need more pressure to soften this. So if we use this technique. So because, before we go ahead, there is Franz who wants to enter the discussion. Please, Franz. If you want to talk. Franz, you want to talk? Yeah. Okay, uh, okay just, please. Uh, I, I want to agree to Andre because uh, we have a lot of patients from different countries and it, it's very um, important that they can keep the result for many years only by compression. So uh, this is one problem, and I think it's true. Right now, we have some pa uh, two patients from Algeria, and they didn't have any treatment at home. And they are very severe cases, one with a severe Klebeltrenu Weber syndrome, and we have to educate those patients. And we cannot educate the MLD for them. So they have to learn the bandaging, and this is the main important thing. When a manual drainage is available, so I think the psychological effect this is uh, important too, not only uh, that it becomes a bit softer, the tissue. So, uh, for example, we use flow wave, you know it by yourself. And so uh, we uh, soften the tissue with flow wave and annual drainage in combination. And of course, the compression is a main important column of the whole treatment. And it has to be there for a minimum 23 hours, for 23 hours, one hour of treatment and then you get very good results. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just trying to summarize uh, other questions but are, because there are many. For example, uh, they were asking if it is possible to perform a manual lymphatic drainage uh, over the compression, above, I mean, with the compression on the limb. Mm. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't think, but we cannot, <laughs> compressed bandages, but uh, if we want, we can add MLD to the areas which are not affect, not bandaged, like to the trunk, for instance. Okay, and then, uh, well, there are some polemic uh, right. opinions because they are in favor of manual lymphatic drainage, and there are probably many let's say many uh, therapists also watching that. And I think we can reassure that at least from my point of view, I think the, the majority of the patients need manual lymphatic drainage, which is absolutely useful in these patients. It is also a matter of logistic. It's a matter of organization of money. So uh, let's say that uh, if you look at Evidence, that's another story, because uh, mm. as someone wrote, probably therapists have not the time or the possibility to perform a lot of studies, and maybe more evidence is needed before we can say how, when, and what is the result of this uh, combination of manual lymphatic drainage with compression. What's your opinion, Andre? Yes, definitely, we need more studies. I mean, the, 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 as I told you, we, we have evidence that this technique uh, it can work, and we have very nice evidence. I like the evidence from ICG lymphography. It is a technique that's working. What we don't have is that it, if we combine it with uh, with uh, compression bandaging, that it is beneficial. Compression bandaging is something that works very well, and then the question is if we can spend extra hour on patient, which we don't have usually for the technique, which actually patient likes a lot, and maybe we too, but, but we don't have additional effect 
on uh, volume reduction. So that's the question. So for example, Dr. Urska uh, underlines how you may need in several cases, let's say, for example, breast cancer lymphedema, to move the lymph to the opposite side, which is impossible, of course, by means of compression. That's why, again, she highlights the need to use mountain lymphatic drainage in many cases, let's say, at least when you need to, in the secondary lymphedema, for example, when you need to use alternative routes and alternative nodes. Well, yes, I mean, that's something that was shown, but we still don't see, we, we, uh, we see, uh, what I see in literature is only case studies. And we don't use it in our clinic. We, we, we usually hospitalize and, and treat uh, a very severe stage three lymphedema or advanced stage two lymphedema of an arm, of the arm. We, sometimes we use MLD, but usually uh, compression alone is, is sufficient. I think different question is many women, which is not, not the topic here, and it was not well studied, but it is significant problem that the lymphedema of the arm is combined with the lymphedema of breast. And that's, uh, that's something that we, I usually uh, ask our therapists to do MLD on those patients, that it's helpful. And the very last question, because then uh, we have to go on, comes from Sergio, in fact, is on the chat. So basically, uh, Sergio asks if you see any role on the adjustable compression wraps, which personally use and I appreciate, of course, and any idea about the, let's say, the taping, for example. Mm -hmm. So the first question is, yes, uh, I think it is uh, wonderful because we have many patients from distant uh, villages and they have no, especially now, they, there's no possibility to treat them uh, as an inpatient and they have no therapies there. So I prescribe them different like circuit or different types of uh, wraps and they are coming back for control very happy because they can they are able to reduce edema by themselves. So this is something that uh, uh, it's working very well. And we do teach them self-applied MLD. So that works together. In terms of taping, uh, we did some studies on taping, and actually uh, uh, there's one PhD student who did this uh, 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 taping in postmastectomy lymphedema. Uh, I was surprised that there are, uh, we, we have seen uh, result, uh, we have seen some, uh, some effects. We use taping in mild lymph mild lymphedema uh, of the arm usually, and uh, with hand lymphedema because we tape. Uh, wearing gloves, compression gloves, it's not comfortable. Taping is much better. And for, for some patients, it is working. Microphone. Atilio, uh, could you put on microphone? Your microphone. <laughs> sorry, sorry. So there is one comment which I wanted to highlight to you, then we have to move on, to move on. I'm sorry. So uh, because uh, from uh, Tim De Cocky says, uh, you should talk also about tonometry and comfort. So something which is not single volumetry when treating uh, yeah. lymphedema. And that's why maybe manual lymphatic drainage can have a role. Well, uh, talking about tonometry, we don't do routine tonometry, but uh, in terms of softening the tissue, uh, bandaging or uh, bandaging it uh, alone works very well. And uh, of course, hand, uh, manual lymphatic drainage also helps, but with bandages alone, we can, uh, uh, we can achieve a very nice reduction in, uh, uh, in softening tissue. Um, what was the second part? Uh, oh, my not thinking only about volumetry, let's say that was the meaning. But you yes, well, the, the the quality of life is also important. But uh, and uh, however, also the, the 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 review, some studies shown that the patients are very happy with this and it improves quality of life, definitely with milder cases. And other studies did not show improvement in quality of life for those patients. So this is something that uh, it is not clear. It maybe depends on technique and type of patients and so on. So uh, we don't have clear answer. 
I know that definitely the MLD is something that patients like and they feel better. So that, but, but in longer time, uh, uh, longer follow up, uh, the difference is not uh, significant. Okay, so uh, I thank so much, Angie. And uh, as we know, he is the president of the International Society of Lymphology. Yes. So probably the conclusion is that we need more evidence and we should perform more studies, especially physiotherapists who have a lot of experience. They should, I'm, I'm provoking some reaction from the physiotherapist as well. So to uh, release more papers, we need more evidence. And we know that model lymphatic drainage could be an option, but probably still we need more evidence. Thank you very much, okay. Andrzej, for your contribution. Thank you. So, sorry for interrupting the discussion. Now it is my turn to start with my presentation, which is a little bit strange, let's say. Okay. You can see my presentation now. Okay, so I will uh, speak about the, uh, let's say, the, the innovative topic of uh, somehow innovative, not so new, but okay, about compression therapy and the possibility to interact with the autonomic nervous system, which is basically parasympathetic system and the orthosympathetic system. Why this kind of topic? Well, I wanted to stress one point. Okay, this is my disclosure of interest, the slide, that there is no specific disclosure. So uh, somehow medicine should take into consideration more than just the vascular system when we deal with the phlebology and lymphology, because somehow we know that mind and body interact. This is a little review we had on psychoneuroendocrine immunology, uh, which is the discipline which studies the interaction with, between different, uh, among different systems. And if it, this is true, when we look at compression, we know that compression has a, a very important um, effect on pain. And there is a lot of literature where we report about the possibility to reduce pain or even stop pain through compression, which is something which could be explained through the acceleration of the blood flow, the reduction of the inflammation, the improvement of the edema and all the mediators involved reduce. And this is true, of course, but probably there is more than this when we deal with pain, when we deal with the somatosensory uh, stimulation. So is there anything else? I found a long time ago this very interesting uh, uh, study from uh, Caprini, uh, which spoke about the possibility to interact with depression and sleep problems through elastic stockings. So it is something like saying that through stockings, we may have a kind of epigenetic effect. And so we are talking about translational medicine. So stockings, not just for, not just for vascular effect, but something more. So if we look at what happens into our, uh, uh, let's say central neural system with stress and with any treatment we may perform, we know that a very important role is uh, dedicated and uh, performed by the autonomic neural system. So the sympathetic and the vagal or parasympathetic system, which is somehow involved in a lot of important functions in our body. So from basics, I mean, from the studies what we can find in literature, they, we know that uh, there are two kinds of uh, uh, important component. One is interoception and the other one is proprioception that we can stimulate with light and slow massage the first and with deeper massages the, the second. So somehow touching the skin and touching the subcutaneous tissue, we are able to uh, perform the so-called gentle touch. And this gentle touch uh, is able to reduce tissue inflammation, fibrosis, uh, and other pathological processes. 
So in this study, for example, we see how the manual therapy or any kind of manipulation can access the cerebral spinal network. So we can in, imagine that compression therapy can exert a kind of gentle touch. So how can we study any possible interference or interaction of a compression therapy with the, uh, the, the autonomic neural system. The most reliable and important, uh, uh, let's say, uh, technique we have is heart rate variability. Heart rate variability expresses the variability of the heart rate during, for example, normal breathing or diaphragmatic breathing, any kind of, uh, let's say, uh, stimulus that we have can change the variability of our heart rate. So heart rate variability was uh, clearly recommending long time, long time ago for the objective assessment of the psychological health and stress. It means that through the measurement of heart rate variability, you can somehow study quite well and quantify the autonomic neural system. To make it short, we could say that the higher heart rate variability indicates a better health, but especially a good balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic, which means vagal system. And it has been used also to study aging, to study cardiovascular and metabolic state of the patient. So through heart rate variability, which is a quite simple technique and also quite inexpensive technique, technique we can study the interaction in the autonomic neural system. Here you can see a few examples of graphics. You can see examples of the main parameters. And let's talk about this RMSSD, which is probably one of the most important parameters we may investigate through this technique, and it expresses the vagal component. So let's move on and see what happens with the touching the skin or compressing the skin. For example, manual lymphatic drainage was able to activate the parasympathetic system with improved heart rate variability and anti-inflammatory activity in this study. So let's say that there are a lot of scientists who are studying the possibility to improve human health through the activation of the vagal system because of the several positive and beneficial effects that the vagal system may have on our body. So somehow we see that manual lymphatic drainage improve the vagal, the parasympathetic activity. Let's move to the compression stockings. This is probably one of the most important, if not the most important article about compression stockings, logical and physiological responses during prolonged sitting, for example. And heart rate variability was used as this interaction with the, the autonomic neural system. These uh, Japanese scientists found that uh, uh, wearing and three hours uh, was significantly associated with a greater uh, increase in heart rate variability. And there was especially an increase of parasympathetic nerve activity with stockings in comparison to the group without stockings. And also, which was very interesting in my humble opinion, the cortisol, which is the hormone of stress, was reduced in the saliva when wearing stockings. So you may believe or not, when you wear stockings, somehow you may have a benefit from the subjective comfort point of view, increasing the parasympathetic nerve activity and uh, uh, heart rate variability as overall. And uh, you see here another study where again, the uh, leg wear compression stockings were able to reduce again the salivary cortisol, which is the stress hormone, and also the urinary excretion of adrenaline and noradrenaline, as you can see here. So wearing especially mild pressure or strong pressure compression stocking, you may reduce the salivary cortisol or the noradrenaline and adrenaline secretion, which is interesting again. Here we have another kind of compression, which is dedicated, let's say, to the total body. 
This is typical, for example, of triathlon athletes and so on. And again, you can see here the variations you may have in the heart rate variability during the wearing of this brassery. But this was uh, uh, true, or uh, let's say, only with the, the high pressure. Uh, because the higher clotting pressure have a, a, a negative impact on the autonomic neural system. So they demonstrated a negative, but an interaction once again. Here is a special uh, uh, article because they studied patients with spinal cord injury. And the graduated compression stockings somehow induced an enhanced sympathetic activity. We know that in the lower limbs, we have a just sympathetic system and not vagal system fiber. So in this case, when you wear elastic stockings in these special patients, somehow you increase the sympathetic activity, which can help preventing the uh, hypotension or post-exercise hypotension because of the uh, induce vasoconstriction through the sympathetic activity. This is another study where they use the electrocardiogram signals and uh, uh, comparing the group with the, the compression stockings, they had, uh, uh, let's say, a lower heart rate increase during the exer exercise. And on the contrary, they had with the stockings a quicker recovery in terms of several parameters of the electrocardiogram. So somehow the interaction with the two components was demonstrated. This is another study where the, these Finnish friends wanted to discover if there was a, any statistical difference in the heart rate variability parameters um, wherein in nighttime special, which are figured here, imaged here, special uh, compression garments, uh, and they found basically no difference in terms of heart rate variability in these subjects wearing light compression garments in night time. So night time is probably not a good uh, time for compression to interact with the heart rate variability. This is a, a review article where they found somehow general beneficial effects, both with low and high pressure uh, garments in terms of recovery and delayed onset muscle soreness. Again, they cannot explain the real factors uh, which uh, determine the efficacy but uh, as we saw before, probably when we speak about, uh, let's say, comfort or pain or performance recovery, it's not just a matter of a vascular effect. As we saw before, it's also a matter very likely also of uh, modulation of the autonomic neural system. This is one of the very last studies that I found on the interaction of uh, compression uh, stockings and heart rate variability. These people were overtrained. A group was, uh, uh, let's say, compressed with the stockings, whereas another group had no stocking. And it was a crossover study. So, well, uh, let's say, well designed. Uh, this parameter, the parameter about uh, the, uh, the parameter about the um, vagal system was improved when the subject were, wore the compression stockings in comparison to the sham placebo stockings. So the end of the study, the conclusion of the study was that the graduated compression garment in runners counteract the deleterious effects from overtraining. And this happens improving the vagal component of the heart rate variability. So there is some evidence that we can act on the autonomic neural system. Now, this is an Italian study from uh, uh, Mancini, Mariani and collaborators. So you can see here that, uh, for example, in terms of spinal reflex excitability, there was an improvement of a proprioception and postural control of the lower limbs when wearing 
graduated compression stocking. So again, there is an interaction with the, the neural system in the lower limbs. Now going to the end, I will present just very few slides because we have just started our own studies. You see here, for example, heart rate variability parameters, the lower frequency in this case, which are typically of sympathetic activity. Wearing stockings, which is the, let's say this column, after uh, in the afternoon during, after wearing stockings, you have a decrease of the lower frequency, which is just the opposite for those patients who do not wear stockings. They start from 112, for example, and they end the near more than double. So wearing stockings permits to decrease the lower frequency in the, the uh, heart rate variability assessment. Uh, in the high frequency, which are typical of the vagal activity, again, when the patients do not wear stockings, they go worse along the day because along the day they get the worse vagal component. On the contrary, with stockings, they may clearly improve the vagal component. So again, there is a demonstration. And this is another ratio that we can use to demonstrate some improvement with stockings. So my very last slide. We have seen that compression garments exert a series of action from the mechanical, biochemical, but also psychological point of view. And uh, we have uh, a confirmed variation of heart rate variability through the use of compression stockings, especially improving the vagal component of the heart rate variability. Of course, we need more evidence, and especially we need to understand a little bit better where this interaction acts, especially as to the vagal component of these uh, uh, studies that we ourselves and other, and other uh, authors have shown. Thank you very much, and let's knit the future together going beyond the classical visions of uh, compression. Thank you very much. So now I move on. I hope that I was not too boring. Okay. So now we move on and it is time for Giovanni Mosti. I hope Giovanni is here with us. Are you here, Giovanni? I'm here. Yes. He's here. Okay. So Giovanni, uh, I don't need to introduce Giovanni because he's very well known. Uh, he's the guru of compression. And if you want to speak about compression, you should... Uh, always have Giovanni on your side. He performed a lot of studies on compression with Hugo Pasch and others. Today, he will discuss a very special topics, skin infections in phlebo lymphology and compression. Please, Giovanni. Attilio, thank you very much for the invitation. I hope you are able to see my screen. It's OK? Yes, yes, we can see. Perfect. OK, perfect. Um, and I would like to thank you especially because you gave me this evening a very simple thing and I like very much simple things and not too complicated things. So skin infection in phlebo lymphology and compression uh, was maybe a, a very debated uh, issue in the past, but I hope to show you that it is not true uh, at the present time. I have no conflict of interest. And uh, I want to start from these because my presentation will focus especially on uh, cellulitis or azipelas uh, and compression, because as you certainly know, there was a big debate in the past regarding the chance to apply compression or not to apply compression in case of uh, skin infection. But we already have some clinical scenarios where compression is used and at the same time we have bacterial or fungal colonization. And this, for instance, the case for ulcer, in venous ulcer we have always uh, or, or almost always uh, colonization or infection. And sometimes we have infection also of the surrounding skin. And in this case, we use local antiseptic or systemic antibiotic therapy but we always uh, uh, add 
contra, um, uh, compression and compression does not represent a contraindication in these cases. On the contrary, compression and local wound treatment speed up the process and compression has never been stopped in this situation. Uh, just in case it, you, you can shorten the dressing time just to, uh, for ulcer inspection, cleansing with antiseptic and changing of local dressing. We have also, also other date on this. This is a, a, a quite recent study. And also in this study, you see there is no evidence that compression increases infection. Uh, compression might facilitate healing in ulcer or skin infection in lymphedema and uh, venous leg ulcer, despite bacterial colonization. And by the way, zinc oxide bandage seems even to exert an antiseptic effect. So cellulitis or erysipelas is a clinical condition characterized by glycedema, inflammation, and bacterial infection. And it frequently occurs in patients with lymphedema. And I hope to have some support from our, I would say, VIL, very important lymphologist today, uh, regarding my thesis that compression can be applied in this situation. And uh, cellulitis or erysipelas is usually treated by antibiotics and non steroidal or steroidal anti inflammatory drugs. But what about compression that uh, is usually strongly recommended in chronic edema treatment? Despite of these, you see that compression has been considered in the past a contraindication for compression therapy. So, sorry, cellulitis, there is a mistake here. Uh, Erysipelas or cellulitis has been considered in the past a contraindication for compression in many guidelines. And it was supposed that compression could uh, transfer bacterial in the general circulation, spreading infection systematically. I don't know why. I have no personal data uh, in this in this field because for me, erysipelas never represented a contraindication to compression. So I always applied compression. And by the way, in this case, as it is an acute situation. I always apply inelastic compression. And my routine was based on three assumptions. Erysipelas always occurs in chronic edema or lymphedema, and compression is mandatory to treat edema. Edema is strongly connected to tissue inflammation, and compression exerts anti inflammatory effect. So to me, there was no reason to. Um, impede me to apply compression. And this is actually what I did all my life with brilliant results. Uh, if you look at, at venous hypertension and fluid extravasation, you see that this leads to release of vasoactive substances such as chemokine, inflammatory mediators, and adhesion molecule. And this increased release uh, leads to increased leukocyte adherence and migration out of the capillary. And out of the capillary, the leukocyte release inflammatory mediators, and these mediators trigger local inflammation. Uh, you certainly know the, the clinical picture. I don't want to stay on this. And compression therapy has three important effects. It is very effective in reducing edema. And this can be shown uh, with the elastic bandages, with elastic compression uh, stockings, and with adjustable compression garments. Compression therapy has been shown very effective in reducing high level of pro-inflammatory mediators, including TNF alpha, reducing the high level of uh, metalloproteinases, and increasing the levels of anti-inflammatory cytokines. So compression is very effective in reducing inflammation. And uh, we have also some data. This is not particularly interesting, maybe uh, regarding cellulitis, infection, and compression. But anyway, compression bandaging uh, was shown to be effective 
also in increasing the uh, microcirculation and in, in patients with cellulitis. So this is another uh, stimulus, so to say, to apply compression. And uh, finally, when applied in other clinical condition, as I showed with a skin infection, compression therapy never showed to spread infection in general circulation. This is the case, for instance, for uh, uh, infected ulcer or for infection of periwound uh, skin. But now we have new data from the literature, and I think these data are very convincing. Uh, we started some years ago with this uh, very nice presentation by Alberto Macho in one of our ICC meetings, and he uh, presented the data uh, that with the uh, multi-component bandages, uh, erysipelas could be treated very effectively. And this uh, specifically means, uh, this is the conclusion of Alberto, that strictly short stretch in elastic functional bandage is effective. And it is even better if associated with zinc oxide or alginate dread dressing. Uh, this is a very interesting picture that Alberto showed us. You see here that uh, we have a, a resipela in the leg and the bandage was applied not on the entire leg, but only under a, a certain point. And you see very clearly that when the skin is covered by bandage, the skin infection or inflammation disappears and it remains in the non-compressed area. So this is something very convincing. There is also a Danish study on this regard. Unfortunately, it is, uh, sorry, it is uh, um, in Danish, so it is impossible to translate it or to, to have a translation, but we have uh, at least the um, uh, abstract in English. And the conclusion is that it is important to treat both erysipelas and edema appropriately by compression to reduce recurrence and morbidity. Then we have uh, the international consensus statement on risk and contraindication, contraindication of medical compression treatment. And you see here, I highlighted that uh, uh, it was recommended to apply compression in leg erysipelas or cellulitis to reduce inflammation, pain, and edema and obviously in combination with antibacterial treatment. We have also another uh, very new study. This is just the publication of the protocol. So I skipped this slide, but this is the result of the study. And you see here, the, the publication is very recent last year and they enrolled 84 patients and uh, they divided the patient into groups, one with the compression and other without compression. And the conclusion of uh, Elizabeth Webb was that compression therapy resulted in a lower incidence of recurrence of cellulitis compared to conservative treatment. And this slide, I think, doesn't need a, a further explanation. The results are very clear. And the authors uh, think that the, uh, re the reduction of uh, cell risk of cellulitis uh, is due to lessening edema, improving immune response and the skin integrity, and provide physical protection for the skin. Finally, and this is very important to me because uh, maybe you know that the German colleagues were the strongest opponent uh, uh, to, uh, of compression in, in cellulitis, but uh, re very recently, this year, uh, a, a, in this paper, in this journal, a, this paper appeared, and once again the, the paper is in German, and only the abstract is in English. But you see, they moved from the um, from the con uh, assumption that we have many recommendations and guidelines that consider compression therapy for acute erysipelas as a contraindication. But they also admit that compression therapy is used in some clinics due to massive edema. And so the question was if compression really is a contraindication for erysipelas or not. And uh, 
uh, you see that they enrolled uh, 56 patients with acute erysipelas. They divided this patient into groups, one with the compression and the other with, without compression. And they were able to show that uh, uh, even the blood parameters for infection clearly dropped and none of the patients are showing an increase in fever or clinical sign or sepsis during the hospital stay. So even our German friends uh, agree that uh, uh, the declaration of acute erysipelas as contraindication for compression is not anymore justified. An important point is what kind of compression? Because you know, compression is a wide spectrum. It ranges from elastic bandages, elastic bandages, elastic stocking, and you know that elastic stocking have several uh, compression ranges, compression pressure ranges. We have in elastic bandages, we have in elastic uh, Velcro devices. So what kind of compression could we use? Uh, Alberto Macho uh, used compression by inelastic bandages. Web, um, it's a mixture because in you see 27 out of 44, 41 patients in the compression group were treated by bandages and elastic compression stockings and only 14 only by elastic compression stocking. Uh, Eber Raber in this consensus paper uh, just speak about the generic indication of for compression therapy. And in the other paper, uh, it is not possible to see what kind of compression they used because as I told you, the, the article is in German and not, uh, not easy to understand for me. So I would like just express my personal opinion that I have no data regarding this because I always use inelastic material, but I want to tell you that uh, cellulitis is an acute complication occurring in edema or lymphedema patients. Inflammation and pain are the clinical features for this condition and compression by inelastic devices, bandages or adjustable compression garment must be preferred to my opinion because they are more effective in acute clinical scenarios. They are able to reduce edema so that elastic compression stocking can be prescribed when the leg has a, its final shape. And last but not least, donning and doffing elastic compression stocking in these painful legs can be really painful. In conclusion, Recent data concealed the old fear concerning compression therapy in cellulitis treatment. Compression therapy is now recommended in cellulitis treatment as it is effective in edema treatment. It is effective in decreasing inflammation and pain. And it has been shown that it does not cause systemic infection spreading. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you very much for your informative talk. Uh, now I ask Martina, because I saw there are a couple of questions. Yeah, Dr. Cavezzi, uh, there are two questions for you. Uh, the first one is from Urska and um, that says, so if I got this correct, uh, lower compression is better for sport. Well, it's not easy to reply because uh, uh, it could be like that, let's say, but uh, we have not that much evidence as to the autonomic neural system. As to sport, of course, there is a lot of literature on sport and compression garments. And uh, okay, Sergio Giannisini performs some study, Giovanni knows all the literature probably, so I don't want to reply on this side. From the autonomic neural system, uh, if we deal with the, the uh, total body compression, we don't need absolutely higher values of compression. If we talk about the stockings, again, we uh, the, the stockings they uh, used in the studies for the HRV, heart rate variability studies, was in the range of 15, 18 millimeters of mercury. They express mostly in Pascal. There was one study on 21 and the rest was between 15 and 18. So as over, overall, I would say lower 
heart rate variability. I'm not, I'm not talking about performance, recovery, pain, and so on. Okay, then there's the second one. Turn on. Turn on. Microphone. I am turned on. Do you hear me? I ask you a feedback, a quick feedback. Okay. 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 Uh, Sergio Gianesini uh, says, Bravissimo Attilio. And then uh, <laughs> <laughs> he asks, uh, uh, do you see any potential difference in below versus above knee, considering the possible skin contact role in uh, autom autonomous nervous system activation? Well, Sergio, uh, I would like to reply again with some evidence, which is not possible, because again, the majority uh, had some uh, total body garments, a few uh, the studies were with the below knee stockings only. I can imagine, I can imagine at least as to my experience, because we in our study, we are using the panty or the knee stockings because the contact with the skin and with the tissue is higher, of course, than the, the below knee stocking. And because we think that uh, it's a matter of uh, uh, stimulation of uh, the neural system. So to make it short, I do think that if we look at the heart rate variability variations, we should expect higher variations with the larger and longer stockings, let's say. But again, it's a matter of uh, study. We have to study a lot. We are just starting and uh, it is very interesting to see how the vagal system can, let's say, be stimulated because again it's a dream of a lot of uh, gerontologists to stimulate the vagal system and this would explain also some results about uh, symptoms and compressions and compression means also water compression means also let's say pressotherapy and so on and so on any more questions to, to, for my presentation, because I see um, a lot of comments, uh, uh, like great talk and work, okay. Uh, and uh, okay. Okay. but Thank not. You. I don't see questions for you. Um, I'm gonna see if there are some uh, on the YouTube channel. There are not, so we okay. can move on. So, if there are no more questions to me, I would uh, move to. Uh, I would move to the presentation from Giovanni, okay. Uh, so, first of all, I have uh, just a little comment and a question to Giovanni. Uh, somehow, beyond the possibilities of side effects, we know that the question is uh, the pain. I mean, when you have a dermatolymphangia denitis or cellulitis, uh, uh, especially in the very beginning, compression can be somehow, if not contraindicated, intolerable. So what do you think? Is there any time to wait or you would start since the very beginning? Attilio, I usually start from the very beginning and I can tell you that your fear of uh, increasing pain has no, no, no reason to exist because the the patient immediately start to feel better. Immediately after the application of the compression, even when they are still in the, in the office or in the clinic, they feel better. And after some hour or, or the, day, the, the day later, the following day, they are absolutely better than before. So, a good, a proper compression has a, a great effectiveness on pain reduction. Believe me. Okay, well, I'm just referring also, this was also a question from uh, Dr. Urska, uh, which was uh, explaining that somehow the patient don't accept any touch even during the acute phase of the very first days, let's say. Yes, but, but obviously, and this, I think this is quite obvious, the bandage must be a proper bandage because for instance, in this case, in elastic bandages has to be, to be preferred to other kind of bandages. You know that when the bandage is applied, 
you don't there is no friction between the skin and the bandage that is not the case when you use elastic stocking because you need to put on and put off and and sometimes it, it can happen that the uh, stocking slips down so there is it is di it is different when you apply a bandage and the, and the bandage is properly applied you don't have these kind of problems even better when you apply an adjustable compression wrap because in this case the patient can even adjust by himself when he feels a pain sensation if this is the case he can release a little bit the pressure or increase if, he, if it is okay and uh, in, in my experience, I, I never saw a patient coming back uh, complaining of, about pain after, uh, after receiving a good bandage. So there is one comment, let's say, from, from Josef Shingale, who prefers to use normally zinc oxide bandage without pressure, just rolling it along the leg. I don't know if you have any experience, Giovanni, about that. Uh, I usually apply some pressure. I usually apply some pressure and uh, I, I, I think that even if you apply the zinc oxide without, without pressure, when the zinc oxide dries and the patient walks, uh, you have some pressure. Mm -hmm. Okay, then Sergio Giannesini congratulates you on your presentation. He asks if there is any special indication in monitoring the proper compression in this special selective case, just to avoid any complication, for example. First no, question. Know. And second question, Giovanni, if I can. Okay, let's go for the first. No, you know, uh, the patient uh, is, is a, a, an indicator himself, I would say, in the sense that uh, if it develops a high fever, it's, it means that something that happens. If the pain is increasing, it means that something did happen. You can, you can see the patient also the, the following day. But as I told you, this is not in my experience. And now looking at the data we have, uh, it is uh, also a common experience, I would say, because uh, even the, the last paper published by German colleagues or the paper by Webb in, in Australia, they didn't see any complication after the application of compression. But you know, uh, the patient uh, can contact you if there are any problems, and this usually doesn't happen. So I so no special would say that the patient is a control of himself. Okay, so uh, can you hear me, Giovanni? Yes, perfect. Yeah, okay. So the second question, very simple. Do you need any special stockings? I mean, the ones which exert a very low, low pressure to avoid the direct contact of the normal stocking with the skin in this case could be an option? I never use stocking in, in cellulitis. So you prefer bandaging, generally speaking? Sure. Yes. And the reason is because the, the strong pressure is more effective in acute stages. And by the way, donning and doffing elastic stocking, this can be really painful for the patient. Okay, from Dr. Ruska, another question. Why would you prescribe elastic compression stockings in lymphedema? This is not for me, I think. Which is not properly the talk that you gave, but uh, what's your idea about compression stockings in lymphedema? So, so uh, as I told you, there are VIL, I would say, very important lymphologists in our group, and they could respond. <laughs> uh, regarding, regarding my opinion, uh, no way to apply stockings during the treatment phase. Uh, in this phase, we need to use uh, inelastic compression, but uh, after the edema or even leaf edema has been removed and you want just to prevent recurrence, you use stockings. And you need to use a special stockings because you need to use not rounded knit stocking, but uh, a flat knitted stocking. But yeah, this is exactly what we also said. Our ufologist guys can respond much better than me. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, another uh, issue from Sergio, would adjustable compression wrap be better than compression with the stockings, let's say, or bandaging uh, in a recipient and monitoring uh, better as a daily checkup the patients? Ah, uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a very good opportunity. And I think also that uh, adjustable compression garment are, I would say the, the, the most interesting new, so to say that they are not really new, but they are new because they are much more used at the present time than in the past, despite the fact that they are, that they are on the market since uh, ages. And I think uh, this is a very important innovation because uh, this, this kind of device allows you, especially in this condition, for instance, in ulcer treatment and in, in resipela or skin infection, to, monitor, to see the skin every day. So this can be done, especially the patient complains of some symptoms because if the patient is happy, he has no fever, the pain is reducing, you can also leave the, the, the situation as it is. So let's go quick to another question from Dr. Kanata. How often did you check the patient when you apply compression in these patients, uh, in these special cases, let's say? For me? Yeah. So I, I, I give them an appointment uh, the following week and they know that they, they can contact me in cases of problems. Okay, a couple of questions which can be summarized from Hild and uh, Nash. Somehow they want to know if you use uh, elastic or short stretch bandaging for how long? Uh, sorry, short, short stretch bandaging or? Elastic, more elastic bandages, let's say, and for how long in oh. erysipelas? No, 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 no. I don't use elastic material in the acute stage. As I told you, I just use in elastic bandages and my routine is, is giving the patient bandages, um, antibiotics, of course, and uh, anti-inflammatory drugs. I usually use uh, prescribed steroids. And in this case, I tell the patient that, that can, they can come to see me again after one week, but they know that in case of problem, they can come again and, and uh, even, uh, even the following day, but this never happened. Okay, one comment the from- The usual routine is after one week. And after one week, I can tell you that the clinical uh, issue is completely solved. Okay, Anjay Suba fundamentally agrees with you because he says that he used compression bandaging in all patients with dermatolymphangia adenitis. And I see a raised hand from Franz Joffer Shingale. Please, Franz, go on. A German guy, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, you can hear me. Video is not uh, yeah. working. Okay, no problem. But uh, scenario in our hospital is. Um, that uh, the, uh, the patient is lying in bed, 40 degrees of fever, shaking all over the body. So we start immediately with antibiotics and with compression. And uh, the reason why we use uh, alginate zinc oxide ba uh, bandage is um, because it cools to, uh, in, in this uh, situation. And that's the reason. So uh, the cellulitis, what we see is very high fever, patient is sh uh, shaking on the whole body and he is severe ill. So he cannot come to the office. It, uh, the patient in most cases is lying in our hospital. And that's the reason why we use antibiotics and direct uh, alginate zinc oxide uh, bandage on top of this because it schools and the patient has to lie in bed and rising the leg. But, but Franz, at least you agree that you need compression in this situation. Of course. Of course, you, you know, that remembers me in the early 80s when, we, when everybody thought, okay, uh, compression on uh, um, thrombosis, deep thrombosis and the others, no, no compression lying in bed. So, and we learned we have to start with uh, compression and walking. And at that time, in the early times, it was uh, lying in bed, no moving and nothing. So, and this is the same situation. And now we have to change the situation is we need 
compression in acute erzipela. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank it you was a so nice much. presentation. <laughs> thank you. So, thank you very much. I think, uh, uh, yeah, one more, let's say one very last question from uh, this uh, doctor. Is the opinion that bilateral lower limb cellulite is not usually correct? I think that he wants to question the diagnosis of bilateral cellulitis. What do you think, Giovanni? Uh, it, to me, is in my clinical practice, is not very frequent, but it can it can it can happen. I, I think that, uh, and I, I, I'm sure that Franz can say something about this. In their patient, can I think th this could happen? Okay. Okay, uh, this could happen, but uh, it uh, we didn't clear. see it. We didn't see it. It's only in one leg. So uh, you have a lot of um, uh, reactions on the skin, but that's not dermatolymphangioadenitis. Yeah. Lymphangioadenitis, you see it on uh, one extremity and it starts immediately and not on both. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as some of you was asking, uh, uh, how can we review this uh, um, seminar, I just put, for those who want, I just put the, the link to our website where this webinar will be put in a couple of days maximum, so you can review all the, the whole webinar that we had, okay? And this is also the current uh, YouTube channel. So, to make it short, also Italians can be sharp, can be punctual, it's exactly uh, 7.26, so we are perfectly on time. And we want to thank everybody. We hope that it was useful. We hope that in the next future, we will have more occasions to share our experience, not just on compression, but on other interesting topics, sharing also a new vision and uh, mission, let's say, about phlebolymphology because probably it is time to change something. This is what I want to say just to conclude. I want to thank Martina because she was a wonderful helping from the technical and the organization point of view. Especially I want to thank Andrei Shuba, Sergio Giannisini and Giovanni Mosti and all the ones who were asking because it was a very well debated, let's say. And I hope we keep in touch for the future. Again, thanks, and let's overcome COVID to meet everybody in person, okay? Thank you, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bravo, for Gigi, bravo, great. Bye. Great. Bye. great talk. Thank thanks you. a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.